Hey guys, welcome back to Old Mean Talking. I am Bob Dub and I am here with John and Roger, whose show it is. So I am the guest host, if you like, for tonight. And I asked if we could please today talk about reacting to hard times as older people. Because last week, I was really fascinated by the way John and Roger were talking about their past relationships and how they'd had to face up to the toxic bits of their past relationships and how they had transformed their lives. And they had made decisions which put them in a place of power and strength going forward into their old age And I thought that that was really, really interesting. And then uh, I caught Roger on Jaffe's show, the the Pirate Radio Network. And I heard you, Roger, I heard you uh, talk about the difference between addiction and substance use and abuse. And I thought that that was also another indication of this, like, ability to transform our lives and to recognize and notice where we're going wrong and how we're going wrong. And it really is, I think, a skill that you develop. I mean, obviously, there are people who who sort of just grow up with it. But there are also people who've come upon hard times and who've found things really difficult and have had to rise above And so, yeah, I just thought that it would be really interesting tonight if we had a look at some of the sort of toxic situations that we've encountered and and sort of look at starting over. I mean, there isn't really such a thing as starting over. It's always really continuing. But um, the benefit of age and experience and if there is such a thing as wisdom... <laughs> So, yes, welcome, everybody, and thank you very much, Roger and uh, John, for allowing me to come and share this time with you. I am really looking forward to it. I'm glad that you're here. It's pretty pretty good that you – I've always enjoyed you being uh, with us on these shows. Yeah, me too. And I've, I've always liked it. Um, yeah, they now, are awesome discussions. They are now, awesome. Now, now we got to decide which one has to go first. <laughs> well, well, Roger, would you go first? Yeah. Would you say something about what you were talking about with um, the difference between addiction and substance use? Because I found that you didn't really get too much time to explain it. Well, it, first of all, it's a... Uh, it's it's a concept that a lot of people really don't like to hear, and I I say it before I even get into this conversation because, like, uh, everybody is kind of brainwashed into believing something that's just not true. Okay, like back in the fifties and the sixties, you know, when kids got together and they threw a party, it it was well. It was common for kids to come together. They had a party. There was no alcohol involved. You know, you had food to eat. You had stuff like that. And, like, families were okay with throwing parties for their kids or young adults that lived on their own through parties because it wasn't, you know, a sort of thing where freaking booze was accepted. Now, in today's world, you look at it, and if somebody says party... It automatically means that booze has got to be there. I mean, that's without saying, you know what I mean? Somebody's going to have booze. And uh, the whole mindset of it is, is like a lot of people, they come to this idea that putting drugs and alcohol into your system is natural when it's not. Okay. It doesn't matter if you're an alcoholic or somebody who just abuses alcohol or drugs. That's what it is. It's abuse because you're introducing a poisonous substance into your body. It's a freaking alien substance. It doesn't belong naturally in your body and it creates a reaction. Okay. And that happens to you no matter if you're an alcoholic or just a regular drug or alcohol abuser, you know, and 
that's the reason why people hallucinate. And the reason why they hallucinate is because their body has to adjust to it. And like, if you've ever heard of people having blackouts, you know, the reason why they're having blackouts is because their body is feeling pain. Okay. And eventually it comes to where your body hits a threshold and you black out so that you forget the pain of what your body's going through. And I had to learn that stuff. So, um, and that doesn't mean that you're an alcoholic. It just means that you're taking a foreign substance and you're putting it in your body and it's causing that effect. You know, um, now, the thing that separates an alcohol alcoholic from a drug abuser or an alcohol abuser is uh, when you take a look at what it does to them, okay? Like something happens to me. Once I take a drink, that's all I think about. That's all that rotates around my head. It's the only thing I want. Nothing else matters. Okay, I can sit and talk to you for days, weeks, and months about all this and all that stuff, but in the back of my head, the only thing I want is booze. And I'll, I'll do whatever it takes to get that booze. And then I'll overdo it to the point where I'll freaking either pass out drunk, forget who I am, end up missing for a couple of weeks, you know. And they ha you break out into spots when, when you're an alcoholic. It's called jails, institutions, and, and freaking alleyways and, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that that's what mm -hmm. happens with alcoholics. Now, with uh, regular alcohol abusers or drug addicts and drug abusers, you know, they what happens with the, the abusers is they party. And then they freaking figure out, okay, look, I'm done with it. I don't need no more. That doesn't happen with an alcoholic or a drug abuse or a drug addict. They, they don't see that. You know what I mean? At, at a certain age, most people who abuse drugs and alcohol, they say, you know, I'm getting up too old for this stuff and they leave it alone. You know, um, that's also another thing that separates them. Um, and, that that's what I what I've learned about it, and that's what I know to be the truth. You know, I'm I've, I've been away from drugs and alcohol for 20 years, okay, but I know exactly what moments in my day I would actually be drunk if I was still drinking. Now I know that sounds weird to understand, but like I can tell that if I was right at, at another time i would have been drunk you know for situations i've been in and stuff like that and that that's never gone away you know what i mean so mm -hmm. um and i i know regular drinkers don't experience that they don't know that you know 20 years away from alcohol and i still have drunk dreams you know wow, that's incredible yeah. So s somehow it's like a, a craving. Do you? No, the craving's like, completely gone. I, okay. I, com oh, the cra okay. craving's completely gone. It just pops into my head when I'm asleep. Like you know, the and, and they're different too from when I first quit. Like mm -hmm. uh, now, um, I'll I'll have a dream where. I, I'm in the dream and I got drunk and I, 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 I can't remember if I've been sober for freaking 20 years or if I was, just, it, it was just a lie. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, I forgot mm -hmm. I drank this time when I know I didn't in reality, but in my dream, I'm telling myself that just weird stuff like that, you know? And it's, it, it, it comes and goes every once in a while. Not, not like all the time, you know, like every once in a gray moon, I'll have those dreams. But but it's still there. That's amazing to me. So I was thinking that you'd overcome this issue. But the way you're speaking, it's like every day is overcoming the issue. Yeah. It's not something that's in your past. Yeah, you, you can't, you can't like... Uh, can't 
say that it's done and over with. You know what I mean? And they've got a saying that says, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing is, it's like right now I'm sober. But the moment I, I pick up any drug or alcohol, I go back to the same person I was mm -hmm. when I was doing that. You know what I mean? It'll I'll revert right back to that. So, mm -hmm. and I have to make sure that I don't do that on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes a minute-to-minute -minute basis, but, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it's, and it's, you know, Robot even said it, it's really like alcohol and drugs are just a symbol, you know, there's an underlying problem that, that I use that drugs and alcohol as. Uh, to, to to take care of, you know what I mean? So I have to take care of those problems in order to not want to drink. That's what I was basically getting at. Yeah. So people say that people say, like, like I've, I've been around a lot of people who've, who've um, drank and used drugs. My second husband was, was always drunk. And so I've thought about it a lot. But people say that people use drugs and alcohol when they're, they're already in a state. People, you, there's this perception that if you use drugs and alcohol, you'll wreck your life. But I've heard that your life gets wrecked and then to try and cope, you turn to drugs and alcohol. Do you agree with that? Uh, not really. Um, my, you know what happened the first time I smoked pot? Mm -hmm. You know what happened the first time I smoked pot? I what? found my best friend, dude. I, I loved al alcohol and drugs from the very first time I, I did them. Okay. Um, there, there was right. no... There was no, you know, oh, I had a problem, so I needed to get drunk. A lot oh. of, a lot of people use that as an excuse. Okay, oh. but the, the truth of the matter is, is I, I freaking loved them the moment I, I, I had my first joint or I smoked my or drank my first beer. I, I that's the way it was with me, you know. Um, mm. So, w when it comes to that, I, I don't. I don't believe that. It's so fascinating that you have these ideas when you when you're dreaming. You have thoughts of being drunk when you're dreaming. Because mm -hmm. John, you've talked about having spiritual experiences in your dreams. Yeah. Which is just a comp uh, sort of like the other side, the uh, the other side of the coin almost. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah. So speak, yeah, I suppose it is, yeah, in that sense. But getting back to mm. the subject about alcohol and drugs, I was really, I would have been about 25. Um, I had, um, what do you call it, blow or whatever you call it, with a few friends of my marijuana, whatever it was, a few friends of mine, never actually bought it in my life for myself. But in partic one particular week, I had it about three or four times. I went to see my auntie in hospital, who had had an operation, and she was on, um, I don't know if she was morphine or something, she's on some painkiller, drip. And I found myself, even though I've never had it in my life, I found myself craving whatever she was having for a pain relief. And as soon as I did that, that was it. I left that hospital, uh, and I never touched blow anything like that ever again. Never touched anything again. Mm. That's, that was like a tipping point for me. And with drink... I was at the point, I was shown, I was at the point that if I kept good drinking like I was, that I was going to become an alcoholic. But I didn't stop. I just, like, pulled myself away and reduced the amount I was drinking. And eventually, like now, I have, I have stopped for eight years. But I wasn't drinking hardly anything mm. the last few years before I stopped. I cut it right, right down, you know. But now I've stopped fully for eight years. Gosh. But I was shown, I was fortunate to be shown, if you carry on like you, you are, you're going to end up alcoholic. And I, and so I, drastically reduced it. I think I went a few weeks out drinking and I just cut right down the amount I was drinking. And then eventually I stopped. Mm. But uh, wow. but to say, Roger, it's 
I totally get where he's coming from, you know, I understand it, you know. Some people, I think, do use drink and drug as an escape. I do think that. They may have had troubled lives. I do think, in Roger's case, that wasn't the case, no. Uh, in my case, I have used drink as an escapism, yes, for certain situations. Because when I saw my auntie that time, when I said I was craving what she was, you know, drugs she was on, it brought back memories to me of my mother then, um, because seeing my auntie in hospital, and in the next two days, I just got blind drunk. I just, to escape it, it was in my mind again, you know, someone's hospital, it was like, you know, bringing it all back again and stuff like that. But, uh, that's, when you're younger, that's what it's like, you know, you've got scars with me of, of the hospitals, my mother's visit was always in hospital and stuff, and, um, I got also emotional scars with, um, a girl, I've said it before on camera, a girl I was dating who two-timed me two weeks after we got together, after two weeks after we got engaged. Um, she started going out with her friends and stuff after that. And I've been with girls before that. We used to go out with her friends, didn't batter her. I never give her a second thought. But because she two-timed me, I was really insecure. And it really affected me. And, I and then um, even so, relationships after that, it affected me. I was with different girls and they would go out I wouldn't like show it so much, but I'm in here it was affecting me. But as I've got older, it doesn't bother me at all now. My partner goes, it's very rare she goes out anyway, but if she does, it doesn't bother me at all. Not even for a heartbeat now. But even now, I still can see myself when I see she's going to be going out, like withdrawing a little bit away from her <laughs> before she goes out. I still do it now, and it's like, four, like uh, how many years? It's 30 odd years ago since you know the events of. The, of you know, the origins of this this pain was, but yeah, I still feel myself like. But outwardly, it doesn't bother me at all. I don't even think about it now because I'm older mm. and white. I don't, you know, because it doesn't. But it's still a little bit of me, sort of like, oh, you know, pulls away a bit. I was conscious of it the other day, and I really, and that's why I wanted to share that to you today, because you, because the subject mm. was about how we how we um, view things like. Uh, trauma or not trauma so much like um toxic situations from years ago to, to like now and that's how it's mm -hmm. that's how i um that's how i am like now so i'm like now mm -hmm. so see i i agree with him on that part where like the last part he talked about where he freaking uh said that that's that's what i was talking about like there's times where i know if it was another time in my life i would be drunk right then and there you know what i mean and that's I, I that's what i relate to when he says that because like for him he he actually could recognize that feeling and he stopped it you know what i mean and that's mm -hmm. that's pretty much the same exact kind of thing you know and uh like i like I said, it goes back to being an alcohol abuser or drug abuser compared to being an alcoholic and a drug addict, you know, going on binges mm -hmm. when, when bad things happen is something that a lot of people who drink and, and do drugs do, you know what I mean? They just, they do go on a bender, but like alcoholics are, are the ones that you don't want at a party, you know what I mean? Uh, drug addicts are the ones sitting in a crack house and all these other crack uh, abusers are saying, look, dude, this guy's got to go. You know, you're, you're pretty bad when you're getting kicked out of a crack house. Mm -hmm. And I've met people like that, you know, when I was in rehab and stuff. And drug addicts didn't even want them around, or drug abusers, I should say, didn't even want them around, you know? Um, so, like that that's what i'm that's the scale is basically what i'm saying like you can tell the difference and it's it is a complete difference between the two there there is a difference between a drug abuser and a drug addict just like an alcoholic and an alcohol abuser um and for me personally all i'm saying is i i never had that period where i was just abusing alcohol you know what I mean? That that's me specifically. So, um, mm -hmm. and nobody can explain that stuff to you. Okay, I, like I'm doing my best to, but 
I, I can't explain it to you. The best I can tell you is something happens when I put alcohol or drugs in my system and nobody knows what it is. Doctors can't tell me. Psychiatrists can't tell me. Your church people or your pastor, they can't tell you. None of them know. They, they'll, they'll mm. do their best to explain it, but they, they don't know the truth about it. Right. I mean, right. nobody does. No. Mm. And uh, for uh, like the dream thing, when it when it comes to uh, the opposites, like with John and the things that he dreams about, you know, that are positive compared to the ones that are negative for me, you, you also have to remember one thing, you know, um, for for every one of us. Well, actually, this is a good question to ask John um, instead of me getting it. Now, John, do you believe that for people, they can actually subconsciously lie to themselves? Subconsciously, no. Your mind? You, you think your mind can lie to you? Try to lie to you to get you to do something you're, you're not wanting to do? Mm. Your mind, maybe, but not your subconscious. No, your mind, possibly. Um, it's really hard. I don't. It's a really hard question, really. Um, in what in what format do you mean? What way that you've been like? In what way is the life coming from? What sort of direction? What's okay? Um, well, not not talking about alcohol and drugs. Say, okay. uh, say you you really want to go out and buy something, right. and you know you know that you have to stick to a budget okay yeah but there's that thought in the back of your head saying well man all you got to do is this and all you got to do is that you know what i mean lie to you so that you yeah, could it's... actually cave in and do it yeah it's like temptation so to speak yes we all get that yeah it's not you it's not your mind though it's like you know, sort of how can i explain it um um we we all inher inherit our, our um we are obviously in our minds and our bodies in a sense, but we're like um how can you say so you know you walk down the road and you see someone and then you talk to them yeah you, know, you see someone and it's like that mentally there's there's like beings all around us spirits all around us and occasionally that you sort of you like bump into them spiritually and your in your mind so to speak you bump into them. And they might not be so good, and that's, they're the ones saying, "Do you, do you want to? Do you want to? Why didn't you try this? Why didn't you do this?" It's it's something like that. It's but it's like a maybe a subconscious, maybe it's a subconscious battle. I don't know. It's something on that lines. It's to do with um. Let's say we're we're alone in our own in our own bodies and our own minds, but we're linked to a, a greater world out there, and sometimes we sort of like stumble upon others in this world and. I mean, they they may not be the sort of best people in you know around, so to speak, you know, nice spirits, so to speak, and they are the ones may tempting you to oh, do this, do that because they want to see you fall, see you fail, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's actually yourself, your own, you know, your actual inner being. I don't think it's 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 from outside sources, but I can't really explain it very well. I I because I've had uh, really bad things come in my head, and I th I know it's not me, and then usually I see that the spirit that's trying to do it i see it um but not always so uh, this is why i i think it's that because most people will get these things in their heads or temptation but they don't see what's what's doing it whereas i usually can or most of the time can um if that makes any sense <laughs> you know what i mean yeah it makes sense you know a battle all the time it's, it's a battle around us all, all the time the spiritual war going on all around us we don't see it but it's there and sometimes that war, they, they would be like a battle for our own souls, and we don't even realise it. And and this is why these little temptations come in because they they want you to go off your path. They want you to do this, to do that, go back drinking again, or or do or um, spend money you don't have, or which will then lead you to a worse place mentally because you'll be in you go to despair or or have you, you know. Um, you know what I mean? Or cause you to rob someone because you, you've spent the money on the item you, you didn't really need, but you got tempted to do it. Stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know? It's it's all... That's what I, That's my perspective of it, in a way. I've lost Bob. 
That was good, it's, actually. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Fascinating. You know, in, in what I've been learning with the, the, the Buddhist idea of it is apparently, according to the Buddha, our mind is a whole committee. It's not just one train of thought. It's yeah. all these different things. And so he talks about all these little subtle tricks that the mind tries to play on itself. And one of the points of meditation is to observe your mind so you can start recognizing all those different voices that give you those different hints. So it's interesting to me hearing you talk about it as being other spirits because I also feel that I, I, things happen in my brain and I think, that can't be me. That's no, not, not. I'm not that person. I'm just not. That. And yet, it was in my head. <coughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> obviously, I am that person. You know. So it's weird. It's uh, again on the same sort of subject. Um, we're all allegedly related. We're all like one with the source. So technically, from what you said about the Buddhist uh, teachings, that's the theoretically right. It is part of us that spirit that maybe is doing this is technically we're, we're all related we're all one but he's like maybe on the other side of the coin to us so technically the buddhism is right uh, because it's mm. we mm. are all we're all like one See. we're all like um on a on a, a silver cord to the source all of us are you know we're all, are living on this planet now so technically we're all you know it's all it's like we it's hard to explain it it's like it's like umbilical cord for um, a woman carrying a baby that's what it's like for us with the spirit world we record it to it all the time and you we're, we're sending for stuff from from us is going to there and it's coming back to us it's like a like a communication feed so to speak you know um amongst other things of course that's what that's my mm. perception of it so i know mm. i got some really weird ideas sometimes you know <laughs> It's it's pretty good stuff. Um, the one thing that sticks out to me too, and uh, I tried to talk with Karma about this once, is uh, on a physical level. I think that everything is connected physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Now, um, the one thing that a lot of people neglect to think about is the physical uh, aspects, and like in the brain, okay, we have receptors. Okay, now Dr. Young gets into the whole thing about the God conscious, and uh, it's also been mentioned about the receptors that we have in our, our brain that uh, connects all these thoughts and everything together. You know what I mean? Now, I've had the thoughts every once in a while but about these receptors. Maybe they're capable of doing things far a lot more than what we know they're capable of doing. Um, people, like, for example, when they're debunking paranormal situations, they they go in and they'll see what the carbon levels are in the house. You know what I mean? Well, that's the problem. You're not seeing ghosts. You, you've you got high carbon levels. Well, in my opinion, I'm thinking, well, what if the carbon levels are actually inducing a situation where they're capable of seeing ghosts you know what i mean it could be yeah. the opposite as well so um i don't i don't think that's a valid argument when it comes to carbon monoxide you know what i mean because that could actually be causing them to where they're either hallucinating or they are seeing ghosts either way i mean you never know so that's something i wanted to mention that was a good that's fascinating. And, you know, like life forms are made out of carbon. So if, you're, if there's lots of carbon, then no wonder your brain or your perception interprets that as being a life form, even if it's a deceased life form. That's mm -hmm. fascinating. I find it's really weird how people use words. They say you see a ghost and then they decide what a ghost is. But you see a something, don't you? You're not yeah. sure what it is, but you saw 
something. Something impinged upon your senses. I believe that. And like, have you ever had those moments where you see something out of the corner of your eye and then when you look back at it, it was gone? Yes. Yeah. No. Daily. Yes. <laughs> yes. But I get to the that, stage now and I see the things now. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. Sometimes anyway. <laughs> sometimes. Right. So, moment wow. of clarity for me, okay, is one thing that I... I believe is important to like having moments of clarity comes more than once in your life. And I think that, that over time people have these certain moments of clarity where they can actually see things for real for that split moment. You know what I mean? So. Yes. Yes. You sort of see with spiritual eyes, don't you? Yeah. You, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it definitely um, happened to me with drink and drugs definitely it was like someone was mm. there look at this look and it was like see look, look where you're at and look where you're gonna go if you don't you know and it was mm. definitely yeah wake up call <laughs> you know so i was on um antidepressants for 20 years yeah. and the every t from the moment they gave them to me i knew that they were doing me harm they made me stupid. They made me not be able to think. I was always sedated. I used to sleep about 16 hours a day. It had huge negative consequences. So I kept on going back to the doctor and saying, these aren't working. And so they give me a, a higher dose or a different drug. And anyway, so after about 16 odd years, I found some, because I was trying to get off them the whole time. I found these research papers that were talking about how cannabis had been used to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I started uh, smoking weed and it was absolutely incredible. From the first time I had a cigarette, a joint or whatever you call it, the, the very first time I felt things happening in my brain that hadn't happened for years. I felt ability to think and ability to perceive. And I have managed to get myself off all the psychiatric jugs that I was addicted mm -hmm. to and that were really, you know, harming me. But the negative part is that I now take weed instead of those. So basically, I've swapped one kind of drugs for another kind of drugs. And the interesting thing is, for me, the interesting thing is, was that no medical health professional has been able to help me with the right dose, the right thing, something that's, that's been good for me. There have been some good parts of taking the medicines, but there's been a negative consequence at the same time. And I'm sort of at the place where I'm starting to think that the, that the price that you have to pay is just too high. Mm -hmm. It's just a pity that there isn't some way that you can get the help without having to pay the price. Yeah. Now, see, uh, for me, I, I don't want to say, you know, to anybody that, don't don't go to the doctors. I I, I don't want to say that because there are some people who have some seriously bad issues. But when it when it comes to um, what you're discussing right there, um, I I know that there are people who use drugs to uh, medicate themselves. You know what I mean. Um, but I also know what was taught to me now a lot of people don't understand what they're hearing when they're they're hearing the word mental illness okay the key word is illness now now mental illness is not a disease it's not something that's uncurable and a lot of people have been put in the mindset that freaking if you have a mental illness you're going to suffer from that for the rest of your life and, and that's just not true illnesses can be uh taken care of and and 
cured. Now, um, if it was a disease or, you know, there's certain degrees of disease and there's some that you're just going to have for the rest of your life, but they're not saying mental diseases, you know, they're saying mental illnesses. Um, so in that aspect, um, you, 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 there are solutions to it. And, uh, the one thing that I learned was one human being reaching out to another, you know, get with people who have gone through the experiences you've gone through and, you know, just talk, you know, relate your experiences with one another, you know, become active. Uh, for me, I had to go on 12 step calls when it, come to sobering up i actually had to go to hospitals where people had freaking jaundice and their skin was turning yellow and freaking sitting in a hospital bed you know and um too drunk to freaking leave their house and terrified go out to them and talk to them and say look man if you want to come with us we can take you to a meeting you know and that right there is another thing you know um get involved try to you know talk to other people if nothing else just you know the the thing of it is is it no matter how much you, you say it, you need other people other people need you and that's the one of the best ways to take care of mental illnesses drug addiction things like that just reach out to your felt be of service to your fellow man is what it is um that's that's one of the best remedies that you could ever do, you know. Um, I don't know if that's good it's, or not. It's brilliant. Hmm. There's a fellow called Johan Hari who gives a really, really excellent TED talk that's called Everything You Know About Addiction Is Wrong. And he talks about his early experiences of trying to wake up a mm. relative who wasn't ever going to wake up again and how this has sort of um, shaped his whole life uh, research, I suppose, into what addiction is. And he says that, he, he says the, the same thing as you, Roger. He says that when they did all the experiments with rats in cages and cocaine, um, what they, what somebody came along and said, but, but hold up. You're putting these rats in cages and the only thing that they've got to do to entertain themselves is take the drugs. What if we put them in a different environment where they had a whole lot of other things that they could do and put the drugs in there? Would they still take the drugs? So they took these addicted rats and they built something called Rat Park, which had games and rats and entertainment of all the rat descriptions. And they found that the rats just spontaneously stopped taking the drugs as they started getting involved with their little rat friends. Mm -hmm. And so he says what you've just said is that the answer to addiction is connection. Mm -hmm. Now, and he's just when it, what what I've learned is is there is a process. You hear the word process yeah. all the time, okay? And there there is a process. Um, and twelve steps is a good example. Now a lot of people don't understand what those are actually about. It's honesty, open minded, and willingness. Now if you you talk to a regular religious person, they understand what those three words together mean. I didn't understand it because I was stupid. You know what I mean? Um, but you, you ask a preacher what that means when you put those three words together and what it is, is remaining teachable. Okay. Um, you have to be honest with yourself first. Then you have to be honest with the people around you. You have to be open-minded and then you have to have the willingness to change. Now change and remaining teachable is the important thing. That's the first thing you have to do. And with those three things. Now, this is where it gets tough, though, because then you come to the fourth step. The fourth step means that you have to take an inventory of yourself. Okay. You, you have to 
admit to another human being the your character defects where you played the part in all these situations that you had resentments for so first before you start doing all that you got to freaking take a look at things that you're resentful for and you have to write them down and then you have to turn around and go to another human being and tell these people look man this is what i have a resentment for and then this person you you need to trust them you need to get their feedback okay so when they turn around and they hear this stuff they're gonna have to give you positive feedback to what you're telling them so that you you can go further and and figure out what it is that you have to do and then you 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 have an inventory of all of the character defects you have the people that you've done wrong is next okay you have to freaking look through these people and they'll tell you look you don't need to mess with this person you but this person you need to go back to and you need to get an amends from and when when you do that what happens is is you're asking another person to forgive you so that you can get rid of the resentments that you're carrying around with you you see what i mean because now you know what part you played in the situation so instead nice. of you you know what i mean instead of you looking at that person and saying how horrible that person was then you're you're stopping and say hold up man he might have been in the wrong but let's take him out of the picture entirely and look at myself this mm -hmm. is where i played the part you know and that's hard that is Gosh. hard that is you know? so hard roger yeah. i have that when i when i first started looking for help um and and it, it's here in new zealand which is very very um feminist country and socialist as well and when i started looking for help uh that there was a, I, 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 there probably still is now but there was a very strong a message back then was that uh one person in a situation gets abused and mm -hmm. that person is the victim in that situation Mm -hmm. And it's taken me about 10 years to realize that that's completely wrong, is that when you're in an abusive situation, you're both abusers. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was huge to realize that I had contributed to the dysfunction of my marriage. And that even though I had felt all these years that all this violence had been done to me, that I was actually a participant. And it was only when I got to that stage and I sort of like bucked the system and said to my psychologist, look, you're wrong. You're actually wrong to keep on excusing me like this. I have to face up to the fact that I lost my temper. I did these these things too i wasn't just this absolute saint and man right. that was so hard that was so hard now the key to that though is letting it go you know like um i i would suggest in situations like an abusive relationship just write yourself a letter write a letter mm -hmm. where you forgive the abuser take it out and burn it and when you burn it you are done with it you've forgiven that person and that'll cause the resentments to go away mm -hmm. just a suggestion though it's one that a lot of people i know mm -hmm. in the program have used use that yeah yeah because you you don't want to put yourself in that situation it's called leading with a freaking with the chin you know what i mean like mm -hmm. you, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where it hurts you so don't ever do that to yourself when it comes to these kind of things mm -hmm. i'm gonna shut up and let john talk all right fine listen to you too it's fine <laughs> i don't really have <laughs> i've never taken anything like um medication like bob has I haven't been an alcoholic. I haven't been a drug addict, so I, it's really hard for me to sort of 
um, not understand, but to have any input then to it, if you know what I mean. So you have me to mm. sort of mm. share anything on this because I don't really have any information on it because, you know, I've yeah. never been in that position. But don't you agree, John, that it does take time? This is this is something, this is a conversation that we're having as older people. Yeah. Like, I would never have been able to to get to this place, to, to get to this place of, 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 of trying to rise above those issues without the time. It's taken me years. Yeah. But as I said to you before, everyone's got their own time clock. It might have taken you years. It might have taken somebody else longer than yourself another person might have done it quicker doesn't make him any any better yeah. or worse than you that just everyone's got their own clock there's no mm. you know so i think it's part of the, uh, the good stuff of being older you, you wiser yeah. you learn from mistakes you don't make them so much as you did when you were younger you know i think it's all part of the process so to speak mm. but um yeah, the medication that you were on, it was, you're taking it because it's supposed to suppress certain parts of your brain which cause whatever um, issues you had, this is depression or whatever, I can remember what you said it was, no? you know what I mean? But they, they're like a general thing, for, you know, for, for like a, um, a typical man, woman, it, that this is the typical thing that will help them. But everybody's different, everybody's brains are different, everybody's, you know. And you, as you said yourself, you, you knew it wasn't right for you. But um, mm. you just didn't have any other way really out at the time, you know, to find another solution. Um, I can remember my ex-wife went on medication because she was suffering with depression. And I said to her at the time, no, said, it's no good, you don't need it. I said, don't need it. And she came off it. And she, she didn't, wasn't on it for long. And she did come mm. off it and come off it. So... Mm. Mm. There we go. So what do you think that it takes, John? What do you think that it is that makes wisdom? Do you think it's just life experience? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, also, if you meditate, you can ask for wisdom. Sometimes you get, it's a gift as well. You can get it from it. Also, it's also a spiritual gift, wisdom as well. It, it's two sides of it, in my, with me. Um... But yeah, experience is the biggest thing, of course. Yeah, mm. you it's got to be, you know. Uh, so, you do, so all of these problems we have, you, you know, there's the solutions like like Roger's done to get out of his addictions, and he's done really well in all fairness. And solutions that you've done with your, you know, with getting off the uh, medication. The solutions you found solutions, which is great. There's there's also as I said before, spiritual solutions for this stuff as well. But that's, you've got to be in the right place to even think about that. You've got to be in a certain place to even think about that. You, co you can't think about stuff like uh, right, raising your vibration when you're, when you're knee deep in, in drink. You can't do it. It just doesn't happen. You cannot do it. You know, you're, mm -hmm. too, you're too far away from your connection to do that properly. But mm -hmm. once... You, you get past your if you get past your addiction to a degree where you're no longer so involved in it then it's a different story but um even with roger with the fact that now he still he has dreams about it i still believe it's easier easier to say than to do it but if it, if your vibration gets raised to a certain level you wouldn't even, you wouldn't have these dreams and uh, the dreams he, or he'd see the dreams and it would be like oh I don't need you anymore, you know, and they just push. It's happened to a neighbour of mine. I don't know the full details. He went through some sort of abuse when he was young. I don't know the full details, but it's affected him all his life. I've been trying to help him. And one day he said, he, there he was one night. He, he saw the dream in front of him, the dream he always has, but whatever abuse he went through. Something told him, you can either go there and carry on, dreaming this like you've been dreaming it for the last 40 years or you can go this way and go away from it and he shows oh i'm gonna go this way away from it and he said that was the first step he said that i've positively taken to get rise above that that trauma and uh, that's that's what he's trying to do now 
But for years, 50 years, almost, I must have been 50, oh, at least 70, no, he must have been 60, 50, 60 years, every, I say not every night, but every so often, stuck in that dream again, that trauma again, reliving it. And then one day, he said, something's told him, you don't have to go there anymore if you don't want to, you can go this way. And he just switched directions. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying it can be done. I'm not saying it does for everyone, but it can be done, you know? Um, and I actually self plug here. <laughs> I got a video coming out tonight about trauma as it happens and my perspe perception of it, similar to what I'm just talking about now. Pure coincidence. I think that's the one I got coming tonight anyway. And um, yeah, so I'm just saying I know that you can, even if you've been stuck in a repetitive cycle for years, for half your life or three quarters of your life, you can get out of it. It's never too late. Just say everyone's got their own clock to do this. Mm. And. Um, that you can be done because raising your vibration and i'll keep saying about it it basically raises your mind your mental outlook it's hard to do it it's hard to, to get when you get there to stay there but when you do it it raises your mental outlook so all little things that used to bug you when you were younger little things like little fears i think you know is he talking about me or was he, or what did i upset them or is you get to a point you think, I don't care, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter, you know, you really, it may sound like, uh, like uh, aggressive, or you you get, you, no, you just don't, they don't matter, I got shown that ages ago, it just mm -hmm. came, came, came to me one day, I was thinking about something, and a message from the other side, it doesn't matter, it, and I got shown it, but you, you don't like, you don't like, uh, they don't tell you, you just, they just show you these things, and they just show you, it don't matter, and it's like, wow, it's <laughs> totally right and it doesn't and they, they don't bother me so much now like they used to you know mm -hmm. but um that's just my perception um i'm lucky to be the place i am you know and i'm not i had such difficult lives as you both have so that's i'm in the position i'm in now but um doesn't mean that i can't help people you know what i mean and i do when i can so mm. well when i, I hear when I hear you talking right there, I hear a change. You know what I mean? Everything that you were just discussing has to do with change. Mm. And I mean, that's, I think what a lot of people have a hard time with. Like, you know, when you were talking about your, your buddy, um, I, I knew an old story. It says you got one dog on your left shoulder or a good dog on your left shoulder and a right dog, a, a bad dog on your, uh, left shoulder or right shoulder whichever yeah. one and you get to choose which one you want to feed you know um <laughs> and that's really what it comes down to um but like mm -hmm. i said i mean th those dreams i have they're not every you know one, they're in a great blue moon you know yeah, really that's, far that's apart everybody. um th the situations when i go through them and they get like overwhelming stuff like that they cause that to happen usually with me and stuff like that but and they, it's it's moments when i'm at my week is when i'm asleep and uh, you know things but, like that so but roger next time you you see this this dreams in front of you look for the way out mm -hmm. look for i've the actually day. done that a couple of times yeah look for yeah good that's that's that's, that's the first that's the major step to stop having them it's look there's always a door out there's always a way out you don't have to um you just look look for the doorway just get out of it you know just get out so you only say you've done it anyway so you know i don't have to explain because you already know that then so that's cool now the one thing that helps me too is like i don't like the thought of other alcoholics calling me a dry drunk <laughs> you know, and that's a sign of being a dry drunk is when you start having drunk dreams over and over again so Wow. If if you start having drunk dreams, it's time to change. It goes back to change, you know. It's something in your life's got to change because if it doesn't, freaking, it's going to end up bad. So, mm. yeah, I do. I do appreciate that. I like how you say it's a spiritual. That the answer is spiritual, John, because well, Roger isn't the first step to turn to spiritual realm you have to admit yeah. to yourself that you're powerless that's that's 
Yeah, that's, that, that's important. That's, yeah. that's why it kicks people in the butt. They they think they got control when in reality they don't. Like mm. uh, we were talking about the bus. You know what I mean? Like you're sitting at a bus stop and the bus always shows up 10 minutes late or 10 minutes early and you get pissed off because that bus never shows up right on time you know well mm -hmm. you, what power do you have you can call the bus depot and make a complaint about it but it still doesn't guarantee the bus driver is going to show right on show up right on time you know so um mm -hmm. for me Fine. that's that's the best way of being able to describe it. It's kind of like somebody going to a drive up in a fast food joint and mm -hmm. they get up there and they freaking are in the drive through and they make their order. So when they get over there, they're getting frustrated because it's taken so long for their order to get cooked and sent out to them. But when it finally does get to them, they freaking people working there are rushing them, wanting their money and pushing all this food at them. So now it's gone from being not getting their food uh, quick enough to, hey, man, you're rushing me. Well, you got to make your mind up. Do you want your food now or do you, you know what I mean? Are they going too fast or are they going too slow? That, that all has to do with people thinking they have control. It causes frustration. You know, causes you frustration and misery. There was um, fascinating. There was a um, long time ago, um, after my mother and father were divorced, uh, there was a chap my mother was was going out with for a few years, and they broke up, and he was homeless. So basically, my mother, being the good person she was, she left let him. And his new partner just stay, you know, sleep in the in the living room. It's just to sort of so they had a roof over their temporary till they found somewhere to live. And I'm not sure what happened, but I basically woke up because I heard like arguing and shouting, and I saw this this person, my mother's ex, then hitting hit my mother in front of me. And I've relived that memory so many times until the last time I relived it. When I went in there, even though when I was, I was only like about, I was eight, nine year old, I was terrified of a little kid, you know. I went in there and I just went over to him and I said, I forgive you. I never had to dream again. Wow. <laughs> never had it again. Mm -hmm. Wow. Never okay, again. I was not expecting yeah. that, John. I never had it Incredible. again. Incredible. I basically took the power away from him in my dream. It didn't happen in reality because this was like... 40 years later, 50 years later, but in, in my dream, I, in or, or, or reflection of it, I just took the power off him and I just, I forgive that's, you and I've just, we've just never had it again. That's what, he, that's what it's about because see, when you have a resentment, you're allowing that person to rent space in your head. Mm. So when you, the opposite of being resent, resent, of resentment is forgiveness to two things can't or two opposites can't occupy the same space yeah you know what i mean it's part and of the that... process i have to go through as a healer to be a healer you you've got to be healed as much probably more than a, a normal person because you can't you can't go too far as a healer if you can't self-heal you have to self-heal and that was one of the things i had to do it, it just happened to come my way and i knew i had to do it so that's why that probably happen perhaps it would still be in my brain for the rest of my life otherwise who knows i don't know mm -hmm. but um yeah so that's <laughs> pretty good yeah so after you've forgiven and yeah. after you've forgiven everybody what do you do next um then i just move to the next situation then um if there's any more just move to the next situation um okay. i suppose because it's not something you're really conscious of. It just sort of happens. You just don't really think about it, you know. It just sort of happens. Um, basic, basically, all the trauma I had when I was young, I dealt with it all in various mm -hmm. forms. My mother's death, because she died in front of me, and this stuff like this, which has emotionally scarred me. I've dealt with it all, throughout, even the, down to the level of grieving for my mother. It's virtually... 
because she's shown herself that she's still around to me, it's virtually not to say zero, but as close to zero as it'll ever be ever be. Is is like a virtually zero grief now. Whereas up until I had a sign for my mother and a sign various signs I've had over the years now, I had a lot of grief, which I held on to for like thirty odd years or more. Mm. And uh like now it's switchy gone. So it's but again it's just as fact as you're a healer, you you've got to do these. No, you don't have to. But it's, I think it's just important to do this. How can you, how can you heal people who are going through like something and you can't do it yourself? And that's, that's the that's the answer mm. I get. You know what I mean? Mm. How can you sell to mm. people that they can not get over grief, but they can make it so grief isn't so painful to them as as uh, yeah, if you can't do it yourself. You see, so I mean, you and. Like like Roger saying about how he's how he's turned the corner from what he where he used to the drunk uh, drink and drugs. Because he's done it, he can talk about it to other people maybe out there who are in the same situation, but they're still in it. And mm-hmm. if he stops one person, if he turns one person's life around, my God, that's so rewarding. That's what it would be for me anyway. And I bet he already mm. has, you know. Mm. You know what I mean? It's 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 like you. <laughs> That's what we're here for, yeah. We're here to help other people because we're all mm-hmm. no one get no <laughs> we're all here together, so to speak, you know. If you can help a fellow person as I said to you earlier about that little boy that I helped the other day. It was yes. so touching, you know. He was so oh you know what I mean? It's just like it's just like it's like we what you you're on the earth for, you know what I mean? It's just it just makes it worthwhile, you know what I mean? It's just thinking, wow. You feel like mm-hmm. you're making a difference, like you know what I mean. It's just little moments like that really make you feel okay. That's good. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it see, didn't make, inflated. Yeah. It didn't inflate your ego. It just made me feel humble, which is good. In yeah. the old days, mm-hmm. I'd be like my ego be up here, but not anymore. Just I feel humble. I feel, you know, great by it. Sorry, what do you go? Now that that's the last part that I had to learn it is being of service to to your fellow man and that's what john's doing when he's going out and and healing you know being a healer um with with me it was about service work and that's really where it counts you i have to be of maximum service to my fellow man you know um Mm -hmm. there's a there's a story that i can tell you guys and it's the best way to do it you know the guy's walking down the street and he sees a hole in the middle of the street and this guy's down at the bottom and uh he looks down and he goes hey man you, you you need help he goes yeah man throw me down a rope or something you know the guy hears him say that and he just jumps down in the hole with him right and uh the guy goes, man, why'd you do that? Now we're both stuck down here. And he looks over at him and says, no, we're not stuck. I've been down here already. I can show you how to get out of this hole. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Uh, oh, that's pretty how good. cool. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Yeah, oh, I, love that. Yeah, no, I can't be of service, I have to say. I've managed to work through most of the forgiveness. I can't think of anybody else that I can forgive. I've managed to settle a lot of those things, but trying to be of service, man, Roger, the thought of that is just terrifying to me. I'm getting terrifying. I'm getting the message to you from the other side. Not yet. Oh. Phew. <laughs> Thank you, other side. <laughs> Thank you. Doesn't mean you're not going. Doesn't mean you're not going to. You know, not. And you okay. maybe probably are already, but it okay. means that just because it's not I've happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to. Okay. Seriously, it just came to me. No, not yet. Doesn't mean you take you know, baby steps. Baby steps, take, as I keep okay. saying. Yeah, baby steps. Baby steps. And like right baby. now, right now. I mean, look at it. We're sitting here having a conversation. You're helping somebody. Yeah. You know what I mean. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just, just yeah. baby steps. So yeah, it is. Well, I think we've come to the hour, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, really we have. <laughs> we have. That was so interesting. Yeah. It was so interesting. It's just the same as last week's subject. It was like, what are we gonna talk about for an hour? And yet so, suddenly it's the same as this week. I thought, Oh 
I only had a little bit to, to share, and it was like, oh, what are we going to talk about? You know, and it, poof, it's gone, isn't it? Yeah, I was gone. I dread them. I dread these every minute because, like, you guys come up with all these conversations or these topics, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to say more stuff about myself. That's just insane. <laughs> Oh, and... Roger, you are so interesting. So the, the <laughs> next week's topic is Roger gets spiritual. I think it's next week's topic, I think. <laughs> no, no. I... <laughs> uh... <laughs> so you, you started us out. You're going to have to end it, uh, Bob Dub. Oh, I'm going to have to end it. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay, now that's, that was springing something on me. I need I need an hour to prepare. Okay, well... <laughs> That was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, yeah, Roger yeah, yeah. and John. I mean, my brain is buzzing. And so thank you, everybody who's joined us. And we will be back again next week with another really interesting discussion, which will occur to us during the week. Yeah. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you also, John and Roger. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your compassion and your insight and for jumping down here in the hole with us. It's very cool of you. Thank so. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, Bye now.